so many switches and lights back there, I didn't know what was happening. Glad to see everybody out this morning. The announcements have been rolling on the screen when you came in. I would, uh, as announcements and God moments and uh, joys, and as y'all all know, or as many of you know, your wayward, misguided, lost his mind pastor lost his iPad last week or two weeks ago. And a friend of mine called me uh, or texted me the other day and said, uh, said, did you ever get your iPad back? I said, I did not. He said, well, there's a new one on the way. I said, would it do me any good to argue with you? He said, no. So I'm very gracious this week and thankful for a friend who stepped in, he said, I know you use it for your sermons and, and your work. And he said, I wanted to make sure that that was replaced and that you did have that back. So we went, saw him yesterday and picked it up. So very, very thankful for that um, today. Are there other joys or announcements or God moments or miracles that you know about this week? I've got one on Jenny. She um, had a, another scan, and that's the second one in a row that showed that things were stable. And there were a couple of places that were actually a tiny bit smaller. So that means she gets to come off of chemotherapy, and she'll go every two months for scans, and then she sees the doctor in Winston-Salem again in uh, April. I thought that was a very good. Oh yeah, that's, and that's he definitely. Calls, he calls that that it's in it's not in remission, but it's in hibernation. Is hibernation. Hibernation. And it's definitely a blessing. And the cancer's still there, but it's kind of dormant. So. Um, I would say it's a miracle that somebody said that Jeannie was stable. But <laughs> <laughs> are there others? Yes, ma'am. Good. I always have to say something because I don't usually hear. Um, my brother is living in a situation now. He has medication, so his schizophrenia is dormant, as he said. He's like, yeah, it's there. But he can actually see what's, he can look back even and see where everything is and it's not right. Um, he's in, he goes to school now with his other people to learn how to be, he's basically 16, he said, to learn how to cook and learn how to pay the bills. and. Um, something happened with a teacher where she was humiliating him and they, he started arguing with her and he's in that situation and he's just lost out of the program. The whole time was like destroyed. And um, it showed, he's, he's like, he's crying and He's like, for the first time they, they saw that like, it wasn't me, you know, it wasn't us. And so I, to me, that's a miracle. I feel like he's been treated badly his whole life. He just doesn't understand that. Miracles still happen. We just have to look for them and recognize them in whatever shape or form they come. Um, Carrie's been talking about the uh, shoe boxes. We will be packing uh, shoe boxes on November 14th, which is the same Sunday that we're doing Charge Conference. We'll meet at Rockwoods and we're going to be there anyways. We're going to meet at 5 and we'll take an hour or so to to socialize and to pack boxes and to move them over to the sanctuary so we can pray over them during charge conference. And uh, so we'll have snacks and coffee. If y'all know me, wherever I am, there's going to be coffee close by. And you're going to do what with the packing? So I'll be putting, going to figure out how many people are coming and then we'll maybe take a list and divide it up and this person can buy so many crayons and this one can buy so many toothbrushes or something like that. So I'll, I'll work on that this week. Um, Sorella needs to know before they leave. Okay. If you're planning on, on coming to that packing party, uh, just get with Carrie. Uh, or if you'd like to donate something for the boxes, uh, get with Carrie and let her know so she knows where things are coming from. Are there any others? All right, and let's take this time to Macy's Day to each other and try to look like you're energetic. Don't, don't do one of these. Oh, it's you back.
<laughs> I know it's hard to wave at Jim like you're actually happy to see him, but you have to try. You miss me. <laughs> yeah. I would miss you. Exactly. Even not here after you, I would miss you. <laughs> Scripture comes out of the book of Mark chapter 10 and we'll be looking at verses 46 through 52. And that is Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52. And that's one, I'll tell you all, I, I love to, when I go back to here talking to people um, before service starts. I inevitably see several people flipping pages so that they're already there. And uh, that just does my heart good. So start with verse 46. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat at the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. And followed Jesus on the road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Please pray with me. A wisdom on high. By you the need for guided intercession. And light rises in darkness for God. Grant us in all doubts and uncertainties. The grace to ask what you will have us of you. That we may be saved from all false choices, and that in your straight path you may not stumble. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. What do you want? As we go through these verses today, I want you to think about what it is that you really want. Not stuff like that $86 million lottery ticket that's out there right now. Don't nobody email me or text me or call me fussing about playing the lottery and gambling. I didn't buy a ticket, it's just a reference. But I did see the sign that it is $86 million. What do you want? 
beyond material goods, beyond everything else, what is it that you want? James and John, prior to these verses today, had asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, we want you to do whatever it is that we ask of you. And he says, what is it you want me to do for you? But what they wanted was they wanted places of authority. They wanted to be their stature to be lifted up. They wanted people to recognize them. They said, we want one of us to be on your right and one to be on your left. See, they didn't know what they were asking. They knew what they wanted, kind of. But they didn't know what they were asked. Because we know that when Jesus had finished his ministry, the last big thing that he did, he was crucified for us. And those that were on his left and on his right were crucified with him. So they didn't understand. And Jesus told me, you don't understand what you're asking. But they wanted their status. They, they wanted material. They wanted to be recognized. Verse 46, Now they, Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. And as Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. I wondered why it said Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Why, why was this important? So I started researching to see if I could find out more about Timaeus or Bartimaeus. And you know where else in the Bible it talks about Bartimaeus and Timaeus? Nowhere. This is it. Nothing about what happens after. Nothing about how they got there to be before. Yet it's written like we should understand and know who Bartimaeus is. He's the son of Timaeus. And it got me to thinking here in the South, I, I know as a dad, when our kids start seeing somebody, and when I started first dating Carrie, the same thing was asking me, who's your parents? Where, where are y'all from? Where'd you grow up? We, we want to know whose son you are. And that's the same thing that this is. It wants to stay. Words are hard. The scripture wants us to understand that Bartimaeus was indeed an actual person. They knew who he was. They knew who his father was. Some studies say that he probably fell from prosperity with blindness and then became beggar. But nobody knows because nothing else is written about him. Verse 47 says, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He heard. He's blind. He didn't see Jesus coming. Somebody told him that Jesus was coming. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Tell people that Jesus is coming. And he cried out to him. When I was studying this week, and I, I rabbit trailed a little bit. Y'all know I do that. And what I could talk about is how a blind man knew that it was the Jesus. Because Yeshua, which is Jesus, was a very common name. Like Bob. I mean, you can think of how many Bobs you know. There's a bunch of them. It's just a very common name, but he knew it was the Jesus. Because he calls him the son of David. And we know that he's not the actual son of David because David lived much long, much before Jesus did. But it's a reminder. It was, it was that promised one coming from the line of David. He knew that he was a son of David. How did a blind man know this? But what I want to focus on is mercy. Bartimaeus said, have mercy on me. He didn't ask Jesus to heal him. He didn't ask him to 
raise his status and, and give him a place where people would take care of him because he was blind and he wanted a nice house and he wanted to have a bed no more. He didn't ask for any of that. He said, have mercy on me. And that really stuck with me because he could have asked for healing, but that's not what he asked. BibleReference.com says that mercy is from the Greek root word, the Leo, and means to give aid to something in need. Bartimaeus knew that Jesus didn't owe him anything. Whatever had happened in Bartimaeus' life to lead him to the point where he was begging didn't matter. It, it, none of that was because of Jesus. Jesus didn't owe him anything. But he asked. He had the opportunity. And all he knew is he needed to ask. Then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. I love this. Somebody in need calls out to Jesus and how did the church react? Shut up. It's Jesus. We don't yell at Jesus. And it's easy to say it wasn't the church back then because the church hadn't been established, but it was a bunch of people following Jesus. Are we not a bunch of people following Jesus? So it's the church. This is how the church reacted when he cried out to Jesus. He said, leave him alone. Be quiet. I may not be a beggar, but I'm not quiet either. I know that comes as a great shock to y'all, that I'm not quiet. But I refuse to be quiet. See, the world tells us not to be so loud. Don't, don't go out, beat me over the head with your religion. Okay, fine. I'm not going to beat you over the head with my faith, but I am not going to be quiet about it. I am going to speak to people every opportunity that I can find. Carrie and I were in a store yesterday and we were talking to the gentleman that worked, that I guess owns the place. He's a veteran and he's trying to buy a home under the VA loan and he didn't know who to talk to. And Carrie was telling him about what all she did, how she could point him in the right direction and have some psychology and all this stuff. And he looks at me and I said, don't look at me. I said, I can't help you with paperwork. I said, now if you want to know Jesus, I can help you with Jesus. I said, I'm a preacher. I said, but I can't help you with paperwork. I could have just said, I don't know what to do to help you. But I had the opportunity to make sure that he knew Jesus. And he said, oh, I've met him several times in a fox horse. You take the opportunity. Carrie gives me a hard time about my friend Sid. And if y'all haven't seen pictures, Sid is a skeleton I've been riding around in the car with. She's like, I'm worried about this relationship you've built with this skeleton. Y'all, I talk to him, but he don't talk back to me. Worry about it when he starts talking back to me. But the reason I carry him around is because I told y'all the first time I, I bought him, I put him in the car. Carrie was like, go pay for him and go take him on out to the car. And I was like, uh-uh. In the buggy, he went. We pushed him around the store, five-foot skill. But it gave me the opportunity to talk to people. People that normally wouldn't have spoken to me or even looked in my direction were smiling and looking and saying stuff and they're like how long have you been in this store I'm like we've been in here forever and <laughs> it gives us the opportunity I had him in the truck one day when I went through McDonald's for lunch and fell in the parking lot looked around at me and went nice he said, he said you can't be that boring I said well I am a preacher so but it gives me the opportunity. You have to make opportunities to talk to people because they're not going to make opportunities to talk to you. As the church, we have to do that. We cannot be silent. I won't beat you in the head with, you, with it, but I will not be quiet about my Jesus. 
So Jesus stood still. I, I love this. Pay attention to what Jesus does when this happened. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. Jesus didn't do anything. Jesus heard his cry and stopped, recognized him, and sent the church to get him. He didn't go get him himself. He could have gone over there and healed him where he was, but he sent the church to go get him. And look at how they, I love how the crowd changes their thing, and we do this as a church, and I'll explain that in just a second. They went from shut up to, oh, look, come, brother. Jesus is calling you. We do it the opposite way. See, we, we have visitors come and be with us here, and we're like, we are so glad you're here. Come and stay with us anytime. Where are y'all from? Who's your mom and dad? We're so nice to people when they come here on Sunday. And I've said this before, and I keep pointing it out because it ain't changed. Then we go to lunch. <laughs> Y'all ask your wait staff what's the worst day to work on. Because we go from, welcome, brother. Jesus is calling you. To, um, my tea glass is empty. You've not been here in two minutes. Where's my food? The reason it's so bad on Sunday is not because of regular customers, it's because of the church. We come here and talk about how we love each other and how we love Jesus, and then we go teach, go treat the people that are bringing us our food and clean it up after it's white dirt. Shut up. Oh, look, Jesus is calling you. That just proves that the church has not really changed in 2,000 years. Verse 50 says, And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. This is a, one of those verses that would be real easy to just overlook. But I can't. Because he threw his protection away. Y'all, I don't know if y'all know, but it is hot in that side of the world. Around Jerusalem. It is hot in the summertime. The wintertime is still hot. And then at night, it drops down to 70 and 80, and you think, oh, well, that's pretty nice. No, you will freeze to death at 70 degrees. I know this for a fact because we woke up one morning in Mosul and felt like we were sleeping in a meat locker, and I looked at the thermostat, and it was 75 degrees. So it's real hot here today, and it's real cold tonight. So him casting off his garments and leaving them that was his protection. During the day, it kept him from the harshness of the sun. And if he didn't have anywhere to go at night, it kept him warm in the chill of the night. This was everything he had. And when they said, rise, Jesus is calling you, he threw it to the side. Because the only protection he needed was Jesus. Real easy to skip past some of these verses. But if you sit and really think with them, everything means something. Verse 51 says, So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my son. Teacher, I just want to see. He knew just what he wanted. Pay attention to the words. It's the same question he asked James and John. James and John wanted what they felt they were owed. They wanted other one, people to see them for who they thought they were. That's what they wanted Jesus to do for them. Bartimaeus just wanted to see. No hesitation. Like I said, he didn't ask for everything else except for his side. 
He asked for the one thing that he had lost. Same question. Two very different outcomes. Verse 52 says, Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Gave him what he wanted. And they gave him the option of what to do with it. And he got up and followed Jesus. That's what he wanted to do after he got his sight. I would tell y'all that I honestly believe this. Bart Mace, his eyesight before that meeting was far better than that of the congregation that was following Jesus. He could see things through his faith that the people with perfect eyesight could. He saw Jesus for he. He knew all he had to do was cry out names. He knew that he was the Messiah, that it wasn't just some other Yeshua, some other Jesus that was coming. It was the Jesus. It was the promised one. His eyesight of who Jesus was was perfect. And when Jesus gave him what he wanted, he followed Jesus. I ask again, what do you want? Really think about that question. I was, I've thought about it all week. My answer keeps changing because you know what? I don't really know what I want. I said I can't even remember what I said at Rockwood was my question, my answer for what do you want? And on the way over here, I thought of something else I want. If Jesus was to come here and be here. Physically, I mean, he's here. We don't have to ask him into this space. He came into it with us. And he asked me, what do you want? I honestly feel like at this very moment, I would say I want the church to wake up. I want an awakening in Christianity. Not the Methodist church, not the Baptist church, not the Pentecostals, though they're more awake than we are. I want the church to wake up. I want us to be so Bible and so out there that people can't keep telling us to be quiet. No, I will not be. Do you want Jesus to put you where you want to be? To give you the things that you want? You, or do you have a need and you just want the opportunity to ask to hear your cry to not be silent anymore are we the church that is telling those in need to be quiet are we the church that's going to those in need saying rise Jesus is calling. If you're honest with the Father, He will be honest with you. And let's be honest, that, that's the hard part. Which is crazy because He already knows. It's like when your mom comes into the room and she says, I know what you did. You don't have to confess, you don't have to try to. We do, we lie. I used to lie all the time. My mom said I'd go slack, y'all. She could always tell when I was lying. Uh, 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 uh. I already know. We think that we're confessing and we're going to surprise God. You're not going to surprise Him. He already knows. You've not done anything, and this is terrifying. You've not done anything that he doesn't already know about. I'll go you one better. 
He knew he were going to do it before you knew you were going to do it. Be honest with the Father. He'll be honest with you. I promise. Not on my word. But on his. He will show you mercy. When you call upon his name. Amen. Amen. We are to the time of sharing our prayer request. Concerns, I would ask for continued prayer for the Williams family and the loss of Robert by Sunday. Had a service yesterday and uh, was able to visit with the family. Uh, be in prayer for Betty as she continues to have some health issues as she goes through and, and the family as they take care of her. I would also ask for a uh, prayer for Tara Mason, who is one of our Christmas kids. She's uh, very close to Jesse for a long time. Uh, she lost her father this week. And the family dynamics were already troublesome. And now those family dynamics will never be fixed. So be in prayer for Tara and her family as they're going through this time. Are there other prayer requests or concerns? Yes, ma'am. Are there others? Continue prayers for Judy and Jean. For strength and rest and comfort. Are there others? Are there unspoken prayer requests today? Let us go to the Lord and pray. Father God, we are so thankful to be invited into your house, to have this opportunity to be in your presence. Father, Father we don't have to wait on you to walk by to come to the area that we are because you're already there. Father, you're here with us now. You are here waiting on us. You are coming with us. You are ever present. Father, we just need to be honest. Father, to ask ourselves what it is that we truly want. If we had that opportunity and we will to look at you face to face and you say, what is it I can do for you, Father? Help us to not ask for the material things that we want. But Father, what it is we truly in our hearts want. And Father, once that is given, to follow the one that has given it to us. Father, not out of obligation, but out of thankfulness. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into this house. And Father, to lift our hearts and praise to you. And Father, to hear your word. And Father, to bring our prayer request, that opportunity, Father, to lay them at your feet. Father, for those who are sick, for those who are healing, for those who are away from us today and traveling, families in time of loss, Father, for all of the prayer requests, Father, both the spoken and the unspoken. We pray that your will will be done. And we glorify you in whatever that is. Father, help us. Help us to awaken ourselves and help us to awaken your church. Wherever they are meeting, whatever name is on the sign, Father, wherever they are in this world, we are praying for your awakening in the church. Father, now I ask that you hear your disciples today pray.
The same prayer you taught your disciples to pray so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us free. Blood of the altar is always open. Please stand as you are able and join me in our affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed is found on page 881 in your hymnals. The words are also on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate. Was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From against he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, I usually don't do this, but I did it at Rockwood. I'm going to do it here today because it's uh, about the same situation. Um, there is a plate in the back. I have never been a pastor to ask for tithing, but we are behind. Um, COVID has slowed a bunch of stuff down. Bill collectors are not one. So I, I've never been one to do that. But I have, the further we go, we've done real good. So, if you'd like to leave an offering, that is the place to do so. Our little cow is back there as well. Our little heifer for um, the heifer project, if you'd like to leave anything there. So, as we go, and yes, I recognize that we're going early. I've never been one to drag a sermon out. I say what God has put on my heart. Y'all will be everybody to lunch. <laughs> and that's for your sermon. <laughs> you are welcome. Next week, I expect the God moments to be, we didn't have to stand in line. <laughs> so, but be nice to your wait staff. You're going to get there early. Be nice. Please receive this blessing as we go. Father God, as we become your church back in the world, Father, as we take our eyesight that you have given us, Father, that deliverance from the darkness into your marvelous light. Father, give us the boldness, Father, to speak. Father, to let others know that you are coming, that you are on the way, and all they have to do is cry out to you. 
Father, I ask for your protection, your hand, and your guidance upon this congregation. Father, as we go from this place, awaken our hearts the joy and the love and the mercy that you have shown us. Father, protect us until we gather once more. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, the son of David, the promised one, and our risen Messiah. Amen. Beloved, go in peace.